And we're on. Dr. Stuart McGill, thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Thank you. I was just complimenting you on your uh, handsome haircut there, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I on, on yours. Yeah. Uh, so I, I found out about you originally through uh, Pavel Satsulin's books. And you work with um, a lot of different athletes to um, get them back in competition after uh, back injuries primarily. Um, so can you tell us like what kind of athletes you're working with and um, what kind of problems that you specialize in? Right. Well, I was a professor of spine biomechanics for over 30 years at the University of Waterloo, and two years ago I uh, retired. But uh, while I was at the university, we uh, had two different laboratories where we uh, assessed the mechanisms of injury and pain due to uh, overload. Uh, and uh, we would apply loads to cadaveric spines and watch the injuries form and that kind of thing. So we learned very precisely what it took to create very specific types of uh, uh, back injuries. And then we measured real uh, people as well and uh, measured the reactions and distribution of tissue stress and, and all that sort of thing. But uh, then we uh, opened a clinic where uh, we uh, would measure and assess the various movement and loads in different athletes. And, and once again, what we learned in the uh, laboratories, we were able to then see what they were doing in their sports that caused the uh, uh, back to eventually break down to a painful state. And uh, uh, after all of those years, we had uh, people competing in virtually almost every uh, Olympic sport, uh, most pro sports, and in some of the sports that don't fit either, like uh, powerlifting was a, a big population for us, and things. We, last week we had a rock climber. Uh, I retired two years ago, but I still have a clinic in my house here <laughs> where uh, athletes fly in from uh, around the world. Um, but what was uh, interesting from a back point of view excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cold right now, but uh, I'll try and uh, uh, fight through that. Um, some athletes need a lot of mobility. So consider cyclists or downhill skiers. They have to get into a crouch to reduce windage. Well, if, if that flexion causes pain in your back, that's a real uh, requirement for the sport. But slowly, we would have to understand how to slowly uh, wind down their pain mechanism, adapt the tissues, and then uh, expose them to cycling or downhill skiing, whatever it was, in a slow graded way. Um, and they'll think of dancers and gymnasts who needed a, a tremendous amount of ability, mobility, but maybe they weren't lifting uh, heavy loads or being subjected to high G forces and whatnot. So they were quite an interesting challenge. And yet, on the other hand, we would get athletes who needed tremendous strength and load bearing ability. Think of the power lifters, uh, the strongmen uh, competitors. And then there were the athletes that needed a real explosive neurology. You can think of dancers and sprinters and some of the heavy field throwers. So they had to be adapted neurologically in a, in a very different way to create that athleticism. And then there's the athletes that would be broaching more into some of the power endurance sports like rowers or the pure endurance like marathoners. So uh, it was, it really became an exercise of tuning their bodies, uh, understand the demands of the sport and then tune their body around their back injury so that they could uh, increase their resilience and uh, also uh, their performance. And, and that was the fun of it all. So we, we had general approaches to, to do that tuning. I don't know if you want to discuss that or not, but um, that, that was the, the, the fun of those 30 years. Yeah, I've, um, I've read a couple of your books. The one that's uh, most uh, relevant to me as a trainer was The Ultimate Back. <clears throat> and I've watched a lot of your videos and um, it, it just made a lot of, since and uh, I would be interesting interested in those uh, uh, general uh, methods that you were talking about to get people on and uh, so yeah let's, I guess let's just go ahead and start there since we so I, well, I don't forget about it let's 
what would the general prescription look like? Yes. Well, we started by first uh, understanding the demands of the sport. So it was a lot of fun for us to, uh, I would always try working with the athlete. So if we had an MMA fighter or a jujitsu master, we'd get on the floor and roll in the cage with them, which was just an awesome experience. Could you imagine rolling with some of the top UFC fighters? It, it was fabulous. Or, or just to set up with a, an offensive tackle from the NFL who's getting on for 400 pounds and feel their speed and their strength and their, their dexterity and the lightness on their feet. Again, it was just awesome to feel uh, how magnificent some of those beasts are. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, and then you would get with a swimmer who would struggle doing a push up, and yet they held the record for freestyle in their country. And you know, it's puzzling what, what were the real demands of the sport. So um, I was lucky in that I, I've always uh, enjoyed uh, both competing myself and, and doing a bit of coaching to know what was required of a lot of sports. But if I didn't, we would work with the coaches and we, and very simple, we'd get out a pencil and a paper, write down what that athlete needs to win that sport. And uh, just as an example, take a, a, an example like uh, powerlifting, let's do the deadlift. Write down the top five things that a deadlifter needs and then um, even the coaches would, would sometimes struggle a little bit. And uh, let, let, let's talk about mobility. Well, uh, do they need uh, loose hamstrings? No, no, no. They need very tight hamstrings. So are you doing exercises to tighten their hamstrings? Um, if they don't have sufficient grip strength and they have to go to an under overhook and they have spine instability, then you see that's a knock against them. If they improved their grip strength and got a double overhook and they posted the bar and bent the bar and pulled their hips through, they would get much less stress on their back in the deadlift. So there would be an example of knowing that if we could get a better grip strength, we would spare their back. So we listed the demands of every sport. Then we would go and measure the athlete. Do you have the demands to compete? If, if, do you have the capacity to meet the demands? If they had the capacity, fair enough. We didn't have to train it anymore. But we would train what they needed, not what they already had. Then my world comes in. Now we have to do it all around a compromise in their back. And what tools can we use to adapt their back tissues, first to desensitize the pain, and then uh, build that athleticism in a way that respected their specific pain trigger. So it was quite easy, uh, and I'm making it sound quite simple, but it is know the demands of the sport, measure the capabilities of the athlete, and train the difference. Yeah, something that really stuck out there for me was, so the alternating grip on the deadlift loads the spine differently than double overhand. Absolutely. It, doesn't it strike you? Yeah, doesn't it strike you funny when you go to the average gym and you watch the average trainee teaching a stay-at-home mom with two kids? After three months, she's deadlifting her body weight, but she might be deadlifting thirty kilos, and they've they're coaching her right off the bat, double, uh, you know, an, an over/under grip. And I think that's insane. That's what you do to win the worlds but you've just compromised your lifting form. So they just thought, oh, well, that's how you coach a deadlift. It's a standard over and under lift. No, 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 no. That's what you do when you run out of grip strength and you compromise your back and you lift with asymmetry. Yeah, I have um, usually teach the double overhand and because of like, uh, from what I understand, usually when there's a bicep tear, it's because of that, that underhand grip. The um, using the alternating grip. So I'm usually not, I'm not training like people that are really competing in powerlifting. So I like the double overhand grip, but then like there might be some people will use alternate grip, but I didn't really think about it loading the spine differently. Well, uh, think, think of the double overhand grip. When you get the bar, you can post, you can 
locked down with latissimus dorsi by t- teaching and coaching mm-hmm. a cue to bend the bar. That yeah. creates a post, and then that post through latissimus dorsi straps and stiffens the whole posterior chain from the arms all the way down to the sacrum. That's a wonderful thing to do for your back. That's compromised if you go for an under over. It's very difficult to get a symmetric post when you're lifting. Yeah, that's uh, I've I've never really put that to put that together before. I do teach that you know you you're trying to bend the bar and you're contracting the lats, but I I guess I just never put that together. If you have the underhand grip, it it's not going to be so. It's because you're not able to uh, get that locked in, like locking in the the lats. Well, it's much easier to lock in the lats and create a stiffer wedge, what we call a lifter's wedge, mm-hmm. um, uh, with with a, a double overhand grip. You know, what's so interesting neurologically is if the brain perceives a stiff, stable spine, it will unleash full power to the hips if you're doing a deadlift or a squat. But once the hips uh, get a little bit sloppy, um, the brain will shut down the neural drive, and, and your listeners will really enjoy this example. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you'll see the World's Strongest Man competition this year that was in January in Africa, uh, 2018 World's Strongest Man. One of the events was squatting on a machine, a load for reps. The load was 750 pounds. So how many times can you squat 750 pounds to the, to the prescribed level? Most of the strong men uh, completed about 12 to, say, 16 reps. I think the winner got 17 or 18 reps. I can't quite remember. But the point is, go back and watch that uh, YouTube sequence. And uh, if the lifter uh, was uh, squeezed out 15 reps, go back and look at number 14. In other words, look at the rep before the failure, and you'll see why every single time. The hips will get a bit loose. There'll be a little bit of a deviation. At that point, when the brain perceives a loss of stability and stiffness, it shuts down neural drive. You won't get another squat out of it. So it's so interesting. Uh, The the body almost has a fuse box in it. So these are some of the things that you recognize. Don't get tired. So you have to train sufficient endurance, create a a perfect tuning between stability and mobility. And if you get those mixed up, you will become uh, uh, a little bit unstable or uh, which by definition means a loss of stiffness, which the body uses for control and the brain will shut down and steal your strength. I mean, that, that, that's what martial arts is. That's what you're trying to do your, to your opponent, make them unstable and, and turn them into kitty cats. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I guess uh, I kind of like knew different pieces of that, but I didn't, I didn't put it together because if I was doing, like every once in a while, I'll, uh, I like to do just like some rack pulls. Like it, it's fun just to like load up a bunch of weight and just lift it three, four inches. But, and it's when my hips start to like, move too much that's when i know i'm, I'm done I, I shouldn't like do any more because i'm like well, something's going to go wrong this is you know there's a difference between you know fine line between like a bad I- good idea bad idea on that on that lift i think and um well, well think of every time you've tweaked your back or tweaked a joint it's when you got out of position you lost form you lost good posture whatever it is mm-hmm yeah, the, the, the body knows this. Uh, not, not, not always, otherwise we'd never get hurt. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we, we all have, uh, you and I have this Y chromosome that gets in the way and <laughs> we, we ignore the signals sometimes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What, do you th- what about the, the trap bar deadlift? Well, when we get into uh, styles of deadlifts and squats, once again, it comes down to the question of tool choice. Is it the very best uh, tool? So um, when when you've got a bar on your back for a squat or a front squat or you're, you're doing a deadlift, take the bar or you're pulling the bar from below, that creates a vertical line. The distance of your joints to that vertical line through the bar 
determines the load on the particular joint. So that load through the bar, that's called the thrust line. The further the joint is from the thl thrust line, the more the load. So if you're able to bring the load back with the hex bar, it's now the thrust line is going right through your ankles. In other words, it takes more load out of your hips. You may be having to squat a little bit and your knee is now moving forward, so it might put more load in your knees. So the hex bar is going to be more of a leg-centric kind of a squat and maybe less of a back and the hip because you're moving your back and hip towards the thrust line. It's the difference between a front squat and a back squat. The back squat, you hip, your hips move back away from the thrust line, but your knees stay close to the thrust line. So it's a very hip-centric type of challenge and low back challenge. Whereas a front squat, you stay more vertical and your knees move forward from the thrust line. So now it's a knee-centric load and it brings the hips closer. But can I tell a little bit of a story on that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I'll, first of all, I'll talk about basketball and, and volleyball. And then I'll talk about an experiment that we did twice. If you look at the typical NBA power forward who's six foot uh, 10 or six foot 11 tall, and they have a beautiful uh, hinge jump. So they take two steps and they jump off the right foot, two steps, jump off the right foot, fly through the air from the top of the key and dunk the basketball. And you say, well, how the heck did they do that taking off from one leg? Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you assess it, it is very much an explosive hip extension. So think of the hip extension acting like a hammer. And that hammer hits a stone, which is the core. And that hammer hitting the, 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 the core creates that beautiful pulse and lift and they can fly through the air. But when you measure the standing vertical jump, it's not that impressive. You would think it would be more because a standing vertical jump is more of a leg power. It's the calf muscles, the knee muscles, etc. But to do a hinge jump, two steps and fly through the air, you don't really need uh, much effort below the knees. In other words, it's not really an ankle-centric jump. It's a hip hammer, and you want to stiffen everything below. Just put a stick there, in other words, and it's a hip power hitting a, uh, a stone. But now let's take... A, a, a very si similar height athlete who's a jumper, but say they're a, uh, let's take some of the great volleyball teams from middle Europe. You know, the great teams from uh, the former Yugoslavia and, and some of those countries where the, the power hitters, they don't take two steps and, and jump as a rule. They jump straight up. So they're the front squatters but very powerful legs, big legs, big calf muscles. They use the ankle joints, et cetera, to go straight up. Now, I, I, I don't know about their hinge jump, but I would hazard a guess it's nowhere near as impressive as the, uh, the hinge jumper. So there are two jumpers, both tall people, but totally different mechanics, you see. So you would choose totally different tools. So now you're asking me, well, what about a hex bar? What about a front squat? What about a, a back squat? Do you see, it, it, these are all just tools and you match the tool to the requirements of the sport. And now you know how to train it by choosing uh, better tools. So there's a little bit of a, uh, a discussion to start off. Um, how you would choose the best uh, squat. But now I'll talk about the experiment that we did on, on volleyball teams. Uh, we took a volleyball team and the coach said, we want uh, all the players to jump uh, three or four centimeters higher. Sorry, we're Canadian, so we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're centimeters and kilos. But anyway, say, say a couple of inches for you, you America. Yeah, we have a lot of, we have people all over the world. It's been heard in America's yeah. like the only one that doesn't use that. I, I, I know. I don't know what's wrong with your country, but nonetheless. <laughs> we love podcast it. has been heard in like 100 different countries now, so yeah, most people yeah. are going to know what you're talking about. Right. So say, say, say we want two inches or four or five centimeters on the vertical jump, and, and we, we used a, a squat protocol. Now, interestingly enough, after six weeks, half of the players increased their vertical jump. 40% of the jumpers lost a little bit off their vertical jump, believe it or not. Hmm. And 10% had no difference. Now, what we, and then we repeated that study again. Had we asked two questions, we would have predicted 
who got better with that training tool and who were made worse. So the first question is, all you players now, if you think you're naturally quick, you stand on this side of the room. If you think you're naturally strong, you stand on this side of the room. And very uncannily, they just chose whether they were going to increase their vertical jump or decrease it. So if you're naturally quick, do you think that adding a squat training program would make you jump higher or you'd lose? Or are you naturally strong? Which way is it going to go? I would think it would help the people that are already good at it. But now you have me, you have me wondering if, if that okay. can be well, like it, anti uh, intuitive or no, not really. If you're naturally quick and you add strength through the squats, you'll jump higher. Okay. But if you're naturally strong and you add more strength to strength, you got stiffer and slower. Yeah, okay. So even though you were stronger, you, because when a muscle contracts, it creates force, but it also creates stiffness. So you see the trick to jumping tall or high is to be strong, but to have a pulsed neurology. It's a boom, and then you have to let it go to allow the velocity in the leg joints to create the speed to, to get up there. So when some strength coaches say, what's wrong with getting stronger? There's a lot wrong with that. You're not tuning the body. Some athletes will do much better by adding more strength if they're naturally quick. But adding more strength to an already strong player uh, means they won't throw as well, they won't jump as high, uh, uh, et cetera. In other words, you weren't tuning their springs. And that's, um, so there, there's an example of, uh, now, now interestingly enough, the second question that we learned was uh, very insightful, was we would measure their height when they were standing. So the tallest goes at this end of the line and the shortest goes to the other end of the line. Now we bring down a bench. Now everybody sits down and you'll see the order changes. In other words, the tallest standing person might be quite average when they're sitting down. So what we just measured was their leg length to their body length. The ones who have a shorter body and longer legs will do much better with a back squat because it's hip centric. The ones who have shorter legs and are more vertical, they will do better with a front squat and propel the thrust line straight up using much more knee power than hip power. So you, you start to learn and get wise on the mechanisms that different athletes use and what's required for the sport. And then you're, you're more savvy at choosing better tools. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It, it, it makes sense. And um, now I was wondering, like when you were uh, talking about the different ones that are like, they're naturally quick, they can, they can jump. And then I was, uh, it kind of reminded me of like boxing, you know, like even like some legendary trainers, like even like Teddy Atlas said, you know, punchers are born, they're not made. So you're not going to turn, um, you know, like a Floyd Mayweather into a Mike Tyson, um, even though, you know, he's like one of the greatest trainers in the world. And so I was just wondering if, if, if there's a, uh, I don't know what kind of question I had other than like, are, are kind of are, are jumpers born and not made? I mean, I, I know everybody can probably improve, but is it like the, the great get greater and the average just stick around average or can you turn somebody? <laughs> well, I think the answer to the question is what you're born with gives you a tremendous advantage or disadvantage and you can only train so much, but some are much more trainable than others. But getting back to that boxing and, and striking question, if you're an MMA fighter, which we've, we've measured quite a lot of over the years, what is so interesting is who hits the hardest. And I've measured the champions of some UFC divisions or those who have at least fought for the championship. So top, top strikers. You'd be surprised at who hits the hardest. And it's not generally the ones with big muscles. The ones with big muscles push their punches. Boom. Whereas the ones who learn to relax, they turn just as Freddie Atlas uh, or Teddy Atlas or Freddie Roach teach spin, pivot off the back, and then boom, you snap. So the body's already turning, hold on, hold on, hold on, bam. And it is a snap or a whip. Those are the ones who hit the hardest. Now, if you weight train 
that and create more stiffness, they will actually hit more softly. So, you know, when you read Bruce Lee's writings, which some people don't appreciate the wonderful science and insight that he had, uh, he said, well, I, uh, uh, I relax my body as I close the distance. And then at the instant of impact, I direct all my force into the punch. When we measure, what was he actually talking about? Now, I never measured Bruce Lee, but certainly uh, some people who've, who've been taught in that philosophy and some of the great boxing coaches. And what they mean is when the fist hits the opponent, they then stiffen and turn their body to stone. So they're not hitting you with the weight of their fist. They're hitting you with a body of stone behind an extremely fast moving fist. So it's a pulsed neurology once again, and it's uh, difficult to train. It is trainable, but you won't do it with say bench press and getting bigger muscles. That, that, that's a bit of a fallacy. Whereas that bench press might serve you very well on the offensive line in, in the NFL, but you, you won't strike harder in, in the cage or in the boxing ring. Yeah, and so with, with the punch, so I will um, start off like everything, like the, the explosion, and then like you let the fist fly, and it has like a, a, a soft hand. The moment of impact, everything is tense, and then you let go, or then you like relax really fast to bring it back. Is that the, the pulse that you're talking about? So it's like it, it, it is. Relax, contract, relax. It, it, it is. That was uh, certainly Bruce Lee's uh, coaching cue, but what we found was that might have been his cue to create stiffness on an impact. You squeeze and then you pull it back quickly. That's a strategy. But what we found is going through the target is with that stiffness is actually uh, more, more devastating. Um, but, uh, oh, the stories we could tell. I, I, I know you're a, uh, a fan of uh, Pavel Satsulin, who's a, a very good friend of mine. And uh, he describes how uh, John Saxon, who, who's uh, still around to this day, uh, the, the, one of the great Hollywood martial artists, who was uh, Bruce Lee's opponent in Enter the Dragon, if, if you remember that movie. Yeah. And uh, Pavel tells the story of how the first time John Saxon trained with Bruce Lee, uh, Bruce Lee showed him a kettlebell. And no one knew what a kettlebell was in the, in the, in the late 70s. But uh, Bruce Lee would very easily swing a kettlebell, but then he put in what became later known, uh, well, at least the karate man will know it as, uh, as kime. And that was as the kettlebell came up to top dead center, horizontal arm, he would then pulse his body, boom, swing, boom, swing, boom. And then that pulsing neurology eventually became the foundation for his uh, one inch punch. But, uh, oh, Pavel tells beautiful stories on, uh, on that. I wish I met Bruce Lee, but he was uh, uh, one who I, I, I never did. But uh, anyway, there, there would be an example of adapting, a, say, a kettlebell swing to teach. So them. does that like, um, I mean, I think you know, but if you don't know, I'm certified through Strong First as a kettlebell instructor. I'm getting my level two in uh, April. I've been, uh, studying Pavel stuff for like seven or eight years. And I've been an instructor for about three and a half. So the kind of swing that you're talking about Bruce Lee doing, is that like the Pavel's swing and not like a kettlebell mean, sport swing? Like the heart style? Yeah. It, it's somewhere of a hybrid in between, I would say. Yeah, so the, the hard style that uh, uh, Pavel uh, uh, sometimes demonstrates, um, that is very much an attempt to stiffen and create stability. Now, I can tell you a, a, another uh, story, uh, but, but based in science, uh, I think our group was the first to, to really dissect the kettlebell swing and the mechanics in terms of muscle utilization and joint torques and loads and that kind of thing. Um, do you want me to tell that story and data a little bit? to set Yes, um, just one second here. Okay, sorry, I didn't know if you could hear my fan. 
I didn't know. If no, I, I, I couldn't hear anything, but. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to make sure it wasn't like going to pick up. So, okay. Sorry about that. I, I, I've been hitting the ears too many times <laughs> to, to know anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, the kettlebell, kettlebell, swing. kettlebell swing. Right. Well, um, when you start to lift a load, so let's just say you're going to pull an Olympic bar from the ground. The, your body is designed to bear the ratio of compression and shear. So this is the compression on your spine, and this is the shear on your spine. So when you bend down and pick up a load, there's compression on your spinal joints, but the gravity and the weight of your upper body is shearing the upper vertebra on the lower one. So do you see how there's a shear there? So the disc is between the two vertebra, and then there's facet joints that lay up like shingles on a roof, and they control the shear uh, of the superior vertebra on the inferior one. Now, when you consider the kettlebell swing, it starts out very much like a lift with a normal ratio of compression and shear. But as you swing the kettlebell through and it comes up to horizontal, the compression on your spine goes way down and the shear load goes way up. So that's not a normal lifting load for your spine. That's, that's uh, something different. Now, there are some athletes, and when we published that study, we quoted uh, Brad Gillingham at the time, who had the record for raw deadlift at the time. So a very, very accomplished uh, deadlifter, but he would uh, had a comeback from, from a, a, a disc herniation. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, the kettlebell swing, he credits that as the exercise for getting his mojo back and allowing him to train, build that capacity once again, um, and, and thereafter, he always used it as a warm up for all his training and uh, competition lifts. The next athlete I uh, interviewed, or at least quoted, I, I didn't say his name, but he said, and he's a very, very strong man, but you know, the kettlebell swing is the one exercise that tweaks my back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we do what's called a shear and stability test on the athlete, it tests whether or not shear is painful and sensitive to a person's back or not. If it isn't sensitive, enjoy swinging. I love kettlebell swings myself, but after a couple of weeks of heavy training, I'm starting to get just a, a sign, a little twinge to know that, okay, that's enough. It's, it's time to lay off now. So, um, the, uh, the, the now I can get back to Pavel. So when he does the hard style and he snaps into that stiffness, which is a, a technique really from Okinawan karate to, to put on the iron shirt and stiffen the body, uh, that is a technique to create and lock a girdle or the iron shirt around the spine to sustain the shear. And it works very well for him. He's incredibly strong. He's a fabulous athlete. Um, but he also flexes the spine and, and tucks the pelvis underneath. Well, that works very well for some athletes, but not for all. If they have a flexion intolerance to their back, it's better not to tuck under and lock. It's better to keep a neutral spine swing and lock at the top. So do you see how the different techniques uh, you, the, the, the swing is a tool, but you should adapt the tool to the athlete to restore their athleticism. You want to bring out their athleticism and avoid whatever their pain triggers are. So it becomes quite precise, but with the right uh, uh, testing protocol, you will converge on what will build the athlete rather than, than tear them down. So th th there's two different uh, examples as to why you might want to use a Pavel strict uh, hard style, or we'll modify it a little bit, or um, we'll, we'll, we'll m maybe use a different tool. Yeah, when, when I'm teaching the, the kettlebell swing and uh, snatch, um, usually at first I'm going for the hard style, Pavel style. Here's exactly how you do it. This is how everybody needs to do it. And then I look and then I'll, I'll start to see uh, some differences. And then as long as they're doing it uh, safely, 
I see like some people will naturally, maybe it's after several minutes, maybe it's at the beginning, they'll start to take on their own style. And as long as it's good from my perspective, then I don't really correct it. I try to, like I have a 14 year old, uh, she's, uh, weighs like 90 pounds and she, she has her like junior black belt in karate. Um, she does like one arm overhead, uh, squats with half her body weight with kettlebell. And, um, she's, I've like kind of like taught the difference between sport style and hard style and she's naturally doing sport style. And so I just <clears throat> kind of try to tune her that way where someone else the person like right beside her in class is doing more like hard style. And I, I say that that's correct also. And there's been this like kind of internal struggle for me since I've, um, well, I was like learning about kettlebells first through Pavel. And then I start to learn about Valerie Fedorenko sport style and the sport style numbers are just amazing they're, they're just flat out better than than hard style um i don't think you can win um a kettlebell competition with hard style especially in like the clean and jerk or the jerk i don't think you're going to hard style uh two 24 kilogram kettlebells 110 times uh but sport style that sport style rack quite a few quite a few people have done that it's not that big of a deal and um so when i'm like when i was learning about this and i was reading in pavels i think it was maybe return of the kettlebell and i was practicing more like sport style and i was doing my sport style rack and then my um uh, uh push press is with spine ex you know spine extension and then I let it collapse, you know, sport style when I'm catching it. And then so my uh, arm ends up by my hip. And then I read, you know, Pavel, Pavel says, you know, if you want to learn why we don't do the sport style rack, read Stuart McGill's book. So that's when I discovered you. And this was several years ago. And instead of my numbers going up and up and up, like doing the sport style stuff, my numbers went back down. But I was like, I don't want to. I don't want to hurt my back. I, I want to be old and strong and healthy and move well. So can you, and I, I still have this thing, like I'm looking at these lifters and it's like, I know if I just did this one di thing different, my numbers will go up today. Uh, so can you like explain like why we might use the sports style rack or why not? Or does it depend like the flexion tolerant or can you just help me sort that out a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the answer is it depends on, on what's the best style. Uh, to compete, you're optimally storing and recovering elastic energy. You're not worried so much about cumulative strain to the tissues. And it's strain that ultimately over time is the mechanical variable that uh, causes tissues to uh, either become painful or outright damaged. It's not load, it's not energy stored, uh, it's not rate of load, it is tissue strain. At the level of the cell and, and, the, and the molecules, that's what causes uh, damage. Um, so, uh, to win a sport, you do what you do. I mean, you know, you, you fight in the cage. You do what you do. It's, it's, uh, but you, to continually train the sport, now you're creating repetitive and cumulative stress that will eventually cause overload in that part of your body. So what Pavel tries to do is enhance athleticism in a strict style because he's controlling tissue strain. And that's how uh, you build athleticism. Uh, now, that, that, that's a neurological, mechanical approach. If you're taking a physiological approach and you're just training the metabolism, then maybe, okay, well, you're just going to create some endurance and, and do the sports style. But uh, he's into strength, 
Uh, and, and when we get into discussions of strength, once again, you should be interviewing Pavel because he's taught me uh, so much in an applied sense on what that really means. Things like when you think to create dense neural drive, the expression on your face goes to a game face. You harden certain parts of your body to build a mechanical composite. If you're sloppy and creating and storing elastic energy to do the sports style, uh, you, you're actually sacrificing some strength. The other neurological part of it is when you repeat certain patterns over and over again, it creates muscle memory. Well, in neuroscience, that's called the engram. Pavel is teaching you strength engrams, not sloppy ones polluted by fatigue, but repeated limited number, strict form, and grams. That's how you get strong in the end. So I, I, does that give you a little bit of a perspective on the, the difference? One is just competing, get the thing up for as many reps as you can. And, and I understand that. I appreciate that's the sport. But uh, it, it may not be the way to get uh, ungodly strong as uh, uh, Pavel is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I keep coming back to because, like, uh, it's hard not to be jealous of their numbers. And I know that I can get those numbers, too. I mean, because my, uh, like, when I first started doing uh, sports style, I'd already been using kettlebells for a while. And I learned about Val Valerie Fedorenko doing 911 push presses with a 70-pound uh, kettlebell without putting it down as a 911 tribute. I don't know if you've heard that, but I was thinking 911 push presses without putting the thing down. And the guy doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't have like a real impressive physique, but it's like, man, I was wondering what I could, what I can do. And so I got up to like 90 over, over five weeks. Um, I was able to do 90 push presses with 70 pounds without putting it down. And then my, that, that next week, um, I was going for a, a hundred and it was between then that I read your book and, and you, you run to that for me. So that's <laughs> that I didn't hit that magic number of a hundred, but I was like, well, what, what do I really want? And, uh, so that, that does, uh, clear it up for me. And so is it, is it mainly like for the sports style? Like, is it the, the jerk position or the uh, queen position? Or is it the, the snatch, too, because the way they, they load the tissues on the snatch, they allow more... Well, well, hold on. Oh, you're, you're confusing me now, Ryan, with so many principles we're discussing. Hold on now. Do you want to be strong or do you want to have endurance? Because, now, think of that question. Because what I just gave you were two polar opposite objectives that compete and fight one another. So the more endurable we make you, the less strong you can be, the less explosive you can be. That is an anaerobic explosive metabolism. Now, if we make you more endurable and give you a higher VO2 max and all of that kind of thing, we ruin your fast twitch explosive metabolism. So we got to play a game here. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you now, do you want the physique and have more endurance and do a lot of repetitions without with minimal effort, you're optimizing springs, you're, you're really creating a nice whip through your body. It's, it's all technique. I get that. So if all you want is a bigger number of repetitions, go and train more endurance and enjoy that. But if you want to be strong, you will be stronger by choosing fewer reps and getting the explosive strength metabolism built at the expense of a higher VO2 endurance metabolism. See, this is, this is what people don't quite get. You can't have it all in fitness. Choose one and go for it, and you'll be better. You'll be, you'll, remember I said at the very beginning of this podcast, list the demands of the sport. Know them, and then go train for them. So you, do you see how you're fighting with, with yourself here? Yeah. yeah it's been <laughs> you want the numbers, there. you want to be endurable, and then you want to be strong. Man, you got to pick one. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough because we do have, like, you know, the snatch test, 100 reps in five minutes with uh, 24 kilograms. And so that falls into the, like, power endurance category. But, 
you just like see these numbers of these some of these guys and like for me personally I like the more explosive to me it, it seems like it it's it, it applies more to martial arts so it, it seems like hard style would be better for martial arts and like my spine doing hard style looks more like my spine doing other stuff and um so but like the the sport style rack where you're like in kind of like leaning back and the flexion uh, that doesn't look like anything else to me so it's like how do i don't see how that applies to any other i don't see how it would apply to martial arts i mean maybe it, it does in some way mental toughness and that and that kind of stuff sure but um uh, like what about the the application to what well, i'll just ask you what about the application to martial arts i come to you i want to be a good martial artist i have a kettlebell do i go sport style or hard style well you're now asking a question based on the principle of what we call transference is what you train in the gym transferred out onto the competition field whether that's a cage or a soccer field it, it doesn't matter that what we're talking about is the question of transference. And what I can tell you and what we have measured there is the coaching uh, is as important as the tool. In other words, if you are a kettlebell uh, strong first coach and you're explaining to your, uh, the people you're training, what you are thinking about, what you're trying to achieve with the discipline of whether it's hard style or, or competition. Um, and, and they're thinking about it. The more they think about it and visualize it and then put strength into that, you're strengthening that engram. But if they realize what they're doing, they will now transfer that. So say they're a firefighter, and, and I'm choosing firefighters because our study was done on firefighters. We didn't show them how to chop a, a, a door down, breach a door. We didn't show them how to chop a hole in a burning roof. We didn't show them how to pull fire hoses and advance it when it's spraying because there's a, it's very difficult to advance a, a loaded fire hose. There's an awful lot of inertia blowback from the water. So all those physicalities, when we explain to them in the training room the principles of strength and, and good technique, now, we weren't training how to uh, chop a, a, a hole in a roof. We were training how to do uh, kettlebell swings and some of these other things. But when we coached it in a way that we were explaining what we were trying to achieve, they did better when they went out onto the fire ground. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's understanding these engrams that we're creating, but plus the ability to visualize what mechanical and neurological and physiological effects you're trying to create. And that's what transfers. So do, do you see how I, I, you know, this is what makes great coaches that they can explain why and then give cues to the person that brings it out of their body. Well, you might have three or four different uh, athletes or trainees, and they all have slightly different personalities. And, and, you know, you may have to, this was Vince Lombardi, for example, is, you know, I read men, which what he meant by that was he understood the athlete and then knew how to adapt his coaching to create what you're talking about, the transference into uh, real life. Yeah, that, that does make, uh, that does make sense. And usually like the, the strong first stuff, it, it does, I always, always keep coming back to it. I, I look at all these different things and, oh, this looks cool. I'm going to look at this. And I'm, all, I'm always back to like what Pavel's talking about. He, he, um, he, I, I started as a trainer about um, 20 years ago and I got out of it. I was like disgusted with the business. I thought that like, I thought to be successful, you kind of had to be mediocre. That's what I saw at, at the time. It was like, you go from this machine to that machine to that machine. People come in, people come out. And uh, then I, I, I discovered Pavel. And I was like, if I get back into training, I was still like working with people in my backyard, in my garage, friends come over, we'll throw some stuff around. But I didn't try to make any money at it. And then I discovered Pavel. And I was like, okay, this makes sense. My mind is blown. 
um, he kind of, he really embodied the, like my ideal. I didn't really care about looking like Arnold in the eighties or anything like that. I want to be a, a, a good martial artist, uh, good mobility, strength, all that kind of stuff. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to get back into training, it's only going to be with his certification, which at that time, the first time I got the 24 kilogram kettlebell, that seemed like quite a, quite a task. I, I wasn't, that was uh, but anyways, um, getting to, um, I forget where I was kind of going with that, but uh, getting back to, to Pavel, like in, in the book, uh, Ultimate Back, you mentioned that he had the strongest pound for pound core that you ever measured. And it shows him doing like a, um, a, a zercher. And I think you like measured him like kicking a bag and stuff like that. So I was wondering like, um, how did you, how do you measure the pound for pound, how do you measure somebody's core strength and determine who, who's is bad, who's is the best? And well, right. That, well, that, that's all a fair question. Um, we, we, first of all, what, when we're documenting uh, how the body works in athletic uh, endeavors, we put electrodes over the various muscles and those electrodes sense the electrical activity, which is the brain sending through the nerves, the signals to contract. So we're measuring the strength of neurological contraction in each muscle. Well, in order to calibrate that instrumentation, we have the athletes and they have to exert against some sort of measurable resistance. And then we measure the electrical activity they're able to produce in their, in their muscles. And then we measure them doing different things. So anyway, through that whole normalization uh, process, we get a pretty good idea of the uh, efficiency of their strength. So what is strength? Strength starts out as a thought. It's between your ears. So that ability to get strong and Pavel and, and some, you know, I think of strong men like Bill Kazmaier and, uh, oh gosh, uh, who else? Ed Cohn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these fabulous strong men all have this ability to think strength. It's that attitude, that ability to create a dense neural drive. Then to get that neural drive down through the nerves to the muscle. It's an electrical density, and this is the skill of it. But that's what we were measuring. And then we measured the force output. And then the last bit, I would hold the athletes down in different positions to get them to create little nuances in the exertion. And then we'd measure the differences in, in electrical neural drive, as we would call it. I couldn't hold Pavel down. I would, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a slouch myself. <laughs> and uh, he would, he would, I would get, basically uh, put him almost in a rear naked choke position, but I would hold his shoulders down and really get a, a wonderful buttressed grip on his body. And he would tr toss me through the air and put me through the wall in, in his torsional strength of his core. There aren't too many athletes in the world who, who've ever done that to me. And I've, I've held top NFL linemen, uh, top UFC, MMA fighters, uh, who else are incredibly strong, uh, Olympic um, um, uh, discus throwers would be a very strong torsional uh, core athlete uh, as another example. But uh, no, Pavel is impressive. He's a beast. And, and the other thing is, is he, he's, he's about my size. He's about 180 pounds. He's not a big man. Um, uh, but, but, you know, some of the other feats of strength that he does, that Zercher squat, which I don't recommend for back health, by the way, but it is an incredible demonstration. Yeah, it, it is an incredible demonstration of strength. But just to watch him do a landmine exercise and how he can pivot around with an Olympic bar with one cookie on the end, you know, he, he just plays with it. And then if you want to get educated, have an arm wrestle with him. <laughs> it's ungodly. Now, he, he does have the skill of strength. That, and, and I'll say this, Ryan, as well. Um, he, he gave me a lot of strength about 20 years ago as well just with uh, uh, 
playing with them in, in, uh, I wouldn't call it training, but we were just two friends training ideas. Uh, but we, we train ideas in the weight room and on the beach with kettlebells. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, when you spend time together, you know, we're going to throw around a few heavy things. And he taught me much about strength. And, you know, I was the, 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 the trained professor, but he was the guru who came out of the, uh, strength, uh, programs of, uh, the former Soviet Union. Yeah, I mean, really he, he held the master of sport designation in in uh, Russia. They they don't give those away. That that's earned. Um, what well, what was the master of sport in? Was it kettlebell lifting or what was the? I I don't know exactly. You'd have to talk to him about all of that. But uh, anyway, uh, the only thing I was saying there was he was more in a practical sense, and I, I was much more from the uh, scientific world. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, anyway, no, uh, Pavel it taught me a lot. Um, but it wasn't all just theory. It was wonderful theory, but it was on the ground, uh, training too. <laughs> yeah. I, I have not met him, uh, personally yet, but I would, um, I'm, I definitely want to, and, um, it'd be great to have him on and get his, uh, get his ideas. I had Fabio Zonin, who you're probably familiar with the CEO of strong first on, couple weeks yes. ago and uh, yeah so Pavel like he's really changed changed my life literally, um, literally. I, I, would, I wouldn't be a trainer now if it wasn't for him I was sick of the business stuff and I, I didn't know what I didn't know I, I wish I would have known about him before but um, uh, if we could uh, like uh, kind of like change gears a little bit I was trying to like think of all the you know I had like these questions written out and haven't stuck to that exactly but something I was wondering about was scoliosis do you, do you deal much with that well uh, I if a patient calls me up and says we can, can I come and see you uh, for my scoliosis and I'll say well I'll tell you right off I'm not the world's expert in scoliosis but here's uh, one of the thoughts that I would have first of all and uh, I would test to see if the scoliosis has an ability to be straightened or treated. And how we do that is we'd hang the uh, individual just from a, a chin-up bar overhead, and they just hang relaxed. We would watch and measure the curve. And if the scoliosis curve straightens out, you've just proven that the spine has to be to straighten out. If it doesn't straighten out, I don't know of a therapy other than surgery that will straighten it out. So there's the start. Now, if it is, uh, if it does straighten out, I, I then do a, an assessment. Um, you may have heard of idiopathic scoliosis. And what that means is scoliosis from unknown cause. Well, I don't know if I believe in that quite uh, so much because when we do an examination, for example, I have a little bit of scoliosis and you can see it when I breathe. Well, what happened was on this side of my rib cage, a hockey stick went through my ribs and, and they've now fused up on one side. So they don't move. So when I breathe, only my right side rib cage inflates and, and goes down. So I've developed a, this, this scoliosis because of a, a problem. So, you know, I look at things like the elasticity of the rib cage and have they had a, an injury there. I look at where the heart is because the heart is biased to the left in, in most people. But some people, the heart was on the other side. So there's a dominant lung and a baby lung. Well, that's been reversed. So now they have scoliosis around the asymmetry of the lungs. Maybe some uh, breathing exercises and the Schrothek exercises of Germany, which were designed to normalize that breathing, might work for that particular individual once you've understood the mechanism of why they have scoliosis. So it's not idiopathic at all. Um, so th these are just examples of some of the assessments that I would go through looking to see if I can understand part of what the mechanism is. And then that leads us to therapeutic exercise. Um, when I, I think of uh, conversations with Bill Kazmaier, you know, the former world's strongest man for the first uh, three or four competitions, um, how did he train his back? Well, 
he went through mental exercises to connect his brain to the different neuromuscular compartments of back muscles. And they're arranged up and down the back. And I would say to Bill, how did you know that the neurology is arranged up and down the back and you were going to train it that way? And he said, well, I didn't. He said, all I knew was what worked. Well, what a beautiful validation of the science that the neurologists have had to spend so much time trying to discover. Well, uh, that's fabulous because if you know there's neuromuscular compartments up and down the back and you were clever, you could look at the scoliosis patient and say, well, these neuromuscular compartments aren't working. If we could get them to work a bit more. So then I would give them some of the protocols, one that I, I, I learned in, in my conversation with Bill quite a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. Then I remember uh, traveling to Poland. Now, this was right after Glasnost and Poland and, and the Soviet Union had just uh, become uh, free countries. And um, we were part of a delegation that met in Warsaw and, and we saw some of the science and, and medical uh, treatments for the first time for quite a number of years because that, that those countries have been behind the Iron Curtain. And it was so interesting to see in a scoliosis clinic how they were using Bill Kazmaier's exercises to train the neuromuscular compartments up and down the back, something I'd never seen in, in North America at all. So isn't it interesting how the full circle of experience and science all, all comes together? But th that's my little uh, story about scoliosis. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not the world's expert, but those are some of my experiences and where I would, where my logic would go if, if I was presented with a scoliosis uh, uh, person. Yeah. So like his exercises, they're, they're just mental exercises. So would it, would it be kind of like if I'm doing it from my arm, I'm contracting my, my bicep and now I'm contracting my forearm flexor. So is it kind of like that with the, but down the back? It kind of is, but he would hang his upper body out over the end of a bench and then say, take a dumbbell in one arm and focus his brain right opposite the end of the bench. So he might get the erector spine AC at, uh, say, for example, at T6. Then he would cantilever out on the bench a little bit more, and then he would work on right and left of rector spine and then cantilever out a little bit more and do it again. So he'd work his spine by moving the resistance fulcrum up and down and then using his brain to focus on activating. So he was educating his brain as to where all those neuromuscular compartments were and then Bill's great gift of strength to put it all together and just let his body erupt like a volcano. Okay, that'll make, yeah, and that's in your book, right? Isn't that exercise in your book, Ultimate Back? It, it is too, yes. Yeah, yeah, that. I, I, I give full credit to Kazmaier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, my, uh, my friend, her daughter is uh, 14, maybe just turned 15, 14, 15, and then she developed like a 30 degree curve pretty quickly. I think like she had like one physical, there was no scoliosis, and then there was like a, like a little bit, I think like within a year, something like that, it developed into like a 30 degree curve. Yeah. And, um, Is she a tall, lanky girl? Yeah. Bingo. See, isn't it funny how patterns uh, emerge? And as soon as you tell me of a young girl who has scoliosis quickly developed through a go go growth spurt, I, I can almost predict she's a tall, lanky girl. You, you won't find it in girls who uh, don't fit that uh, particular pattern. So uh, usually there, there's a little bit of a motor control issue. Uh, is she really well coordinated and has learned how to stiffen her body and hold weight? Or is it a bit more of a, uh, a uh, less strength kind of a neurology in her, in her tone, in her body? I would say probably uh, less, but she's athletic. She, uh, like plays basketball and ah, okay. like run, runs and stuff. But um, I worked with her for uh, just like a, a quick, probably not even like 10 minutes with kettlebells. And so I think that she could catch on to this uh, strength stuff. Um, but um, like the, they put her in a, in, a, in a brace, in a back brace and um, – like in my mind, I always think that there's got to be a way, there has to be a way to straighten out. Then I wonder, you know, maybe like some of the said, like, do you even want it would straighten out, like mess something up? 
Yeah. Right. Well, may I suggest that before you give her a kettlebell strengthening routine with that particular con condition, I'd be doing things like side planks and bird dogs, uh, giving her the neurological wisdom to activate all parts of her back and try and build symmetry that way first. Then you can put in the dynamic strength of uh, kettlebells. Yeah, her uh, doctor recommended kettlebells, but does he really know what what to do? Because that was kind of part of my thing also. Is like, it seems like there's a big difference between some physical therapists and and not. Like I think Pavel, like when he recommends a physical therapy, he says, make sure they're really strong. Make sure they, they work with athletes because there does seem to be a, a difference. And so like if she was going to a medical professional, um, is, it, is there a particular like kind that understands the stuff better? Is it the chiropractor, the physical therapist, or is it just finding the right person and you don't, Well, the title means little to me these days. It's a matter of finding the right person and then have they built uh, a few, well, in, in my case, athletes who have quite damaged backs and have they taken them back to world-class uh, levels again? If they've done that a hundred times, they probably know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. If they've never done it, but they're giving opinions on Facebook, I'd run the other way. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I appreciate that. That, that does, that definitely gives a, a solid place to start. So um, the, so like with the scoliosis, would, are you, should they do like the same, like the side plank, the same amount of time, left side, right side? Or well, I, 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 again, I, if we get into specific numbers, I need the person in front of me. I have no idea what, what, what I'm dealing with here. Is she robust or is she fragile or what mm -hmm. other, uh, you know, I might see things right away and say, look, we're not even there yet. We're going to do this. Or mm -hmm. she might be so robust. I'm say, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. but anyway, so I can't give numbers and discuss specific exercises until we have the person in front of us. But we would go through an assessment and find out, uh, we'd explore the mechanics, and we'd find out if she has pain triggers, uh, and, and all of that. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I appreciate that. And um, the one thing I was wanting to ask about also was, uh, um, maybe it has something to do with the scoliosis, but maybe not necessarily. I, uh, is, what do you think about in, inversion tables for people, just like anybody? Just or scoliosis also, but is there, what do you, what's your thoughts on those? Well, uh, let's see, it would have been close to 30 years ago. I was measuring uh, the effects on the spine of, of different inversion tables and lengths of times and, and that kind of thing. Um, if you can apply traction to the spine, of a particular type of disc bulge, and I'm talking about a disc bulge that has a posterior fissure to it. So it's more of a lifter's type of a disc bulge. I'm not talking about a yogi practitioner's type of a disc bulge. That's more of a motion uh, driven one, but one that's been driven by load and uh, bending forward. So that's the lifter's style of, of bulge. Um, if you apply traction to the spine with some extension, uh, we've measured that you re can reduce the posterior pressure in, in the disc bulge. So that's kind of a good thing. You vacuum it in. But it does nothing if you go right back to sitting slouched again or tying your shoes. In other words, it, it does it right away. So if you combine that therapy with preventing the cause, uh, over time you will probably uh, create a plug and uh, stop that dynamic fissure and, and disc bulge from uh, coming back. So the inversion table, if you could get that extension and you knew that amount of uh, precision, it might help. Um, if you are trying to create disc space or space between the vertebra, uh, it, it's true, the inversion table will add a tiny amount of space between each uh, vertebra. However, once you stand up within 15 minutes, it's all gone. 
So, <laughs> um, save my two hundred dollars. Right. So here, here, here's my point. A spine is a body part that you don't get too many second chances with. So yeah, I would t look after it rather than use an inversion table. Why don't you just try laying on your tummy? If you're a young person with a disc bulge and uh, chances are that that will uh, do the trick. If someone were to pull on your legs and apply traction and if they knew what they were doing. So when I teach those manual traction techniques to people, some of them get it. They know precisely how much force to pull. They know what angle to pull at. Uh, if there's neural tension, in other words, they might have sciatic tension or femoral nerve root tension. Um, if you know this, you can tune the angle and the amount of traction that you're going to apply. In other words, a skilled clinician will never be replaced by a machine like an inversion table. So th there, there's a little bit of uh, uh, perhaps uh, some food for thought on your decisions on, on whether you, you want to go with a, a track an inversion table. But uh, uh, th that th they only ever will be part of a much more comprehensive uh, effort of removing the cause uh, and uh, building appropriate stability and mobility, uh, learning how to train more uh, effectively, et cetera. Yeah, I just, I was wondering, it's like, just, you know, just for the everyday person, I mean, I, you know, I lift, of course, and I was, sometimes like when I do like a, a, a forward fold, I'll feel like my, uh, like bones kind of popping in it. Oh, and I wonder if they're popping like into a place they more likely like should be. Or are they, because we're designed, I think, to stand upright and walk around this way and not be upside down. But sometimes I'll do like a forward fold. Maybe I'll clasp my hands behind my back and then I'll like raise my arms up. So my, I'm bent over forward and my arms are more like vertical and, and I can feel like some like popping and it feels like things are popping into place like where they should be. But I was like, well, well maybe they're popping out of place and that's not a good thing. Is you have I mean, maybe it's really hard to know what's going on. Um, but like, generally speaking, like there's like the forward folds in that kind of way and you feel like your spine popping. Is that seem like a good thing or a bad thing? Or? If, you, if, you, if we had the person in front of us, I could answer that question. Yeah. I would have to know about how much mobility that they have in the joints. I would need to know if they have unstable joints or joints that have lost their natural stiffness. Uh, maybe they have some disc damage or ligament damage at a particular joint. Uh, but we would be able to assess all that and, and figure it out. Uh, we would also know at that time if it was part of their pain triggers or it was simply a release that they perceived. Uh, maybe it was a stretch reflex. Um, that it uh, gave them pain-free motion. Um, I, again, until we had that person in front of us, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like to me, because I, like I naturally, like my right shoulder, I kind of wants to come down. So like when I do that forward fold, it feels like it pops more like into place, but yeah, I'm sure it's hard. Well, to when, you, when you see something popping into place, uh, that is possible with a highly unstable joint. Um, it's probably uh, more improbable, though, that that's the particular mechanism. You, you might be perceiving a stretch reflex, and, and now you're getting a, a different neurological perception, which is immediate, by the way. It's 300 milliseconds. Uh, that might be what you're, you're, you're feeling. I, again, without getting my hands on you, I wouldn't have a clue uh, which way we're going here. Yeah, it's amazing how complicated the body is. And I, I've been studying this stuff for a long time, but there, I still feel like, I kind of like feel like I know where to go for answers. Like I know like your books and Pavel stuff, but it's just like there's so much to know about like what this body can do and we have them our, our whole lives. Um, and I've tied you up for like a, a long time. I could I could talk to you forever. Um, is there uh, um, like anything new that you're like teaching? I guess my, my, my last question is like, have you changed your mind about anything recently? Like, were you saying, were you saying something five years ago? You know, like, 
whether it's like the Jefferson lift or something like that, where you're seeing something and just recently you're like, Oh, actually I, now I think this way, or is there anything that we ha else that we haven't touched on that you were wanting to get into? Not really. I would have to say I really haven't changed my fundamental position, uh, which is a good thing. Because if you're a scientist and you're publishing papers uh, advising people on how things works, because that, that's what science is all about, trying to describe the nature of things. And then you come back 10 years later and say, oh, I made a mistake. It's really this now. You have a problem of credibility as a scientist because what you were uh, uh, advising people on previously, if it was wrong, maybe what you're doing right now is also wrong. Mm -hmm. So when you converge on a position of thought or, or understanding of mechanism, whatever it is, hopefully you've done enough work that you're quite robust in the different perspectives that you've brought together to create that position. And uh, I, I get a little wary when I hear of scientists who say, oh, well, I, I don't think that anymore. Now, occasionally, it, it, will, it will happen. There'll be a new breakthrough in technology, perhaps. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I would have to say the general theme that we've developed over the years of strategic mobility and stability and how to do it, they've only added to our general impressions on how this whole body uh, works. So I, I haven't really radically changed my mind. What I will say is I've certainly grown wiser and deeper in my understanding of all of this. And, and I think in, in terms of my own personal journey, I'm, I'm a better person now than, than I was as, as a clinician and a professor in other words, I would say I have more um, uh, uh, tolerance of uh, others, other people's points of view. And, and I've also had a chance to meet masters of different approaches and techniques and schools over the years where when I was younger, I was going to say, oh, this is a pile of hogwash. Or, but when you really study, and if they are the best, the master of their craft, there's usually something in it. And if you keep trying to study what it is that they're that they're doing, um, you, you, you you come to realize that somewhere there, there's there's probably uh, some wisdom to it. So I would say, in of myself and my own personal journey, I've probably changed and become uh, a little more open-minded and and hopefully a a kinder, gentler kind of a, a person and and. Uh, in, in discussing all of these points of view with uh, different schools of thought. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause like the, you know, just like I keep coming back to like the pobbles and the fundamentals and the stuff that makes sense, even though, you know, it can be, you know, it's fun to play around these different games of movement and stuff that everybody's doing, but it seems like there's also a lot of like novelty, I think. And there's like some stuff that are trendy kinds of things going on and, you know, for the most part, I don't care what people do, but like when I'm, people pay me a pretty good amount of money, you know, per hour to know what I'm talking about. They can go to the gym a lot cheaper for, you know, one session, they can pay for months, a couple months of at the gym, but for one hour, you know, they, they really expect me to know what I'm talking about and be safe. And so there's really like a couple of people that I keep coming back to and it's, it's you and Pavel are like the main uh, people that I try to study and, and learn about. And I like how you like bridge the gap between uh, the, uh, like a, a medical professional and a personal trainer. It's like if somebody comes to me and they have like some kind of pain and like, and it's like, I don't know about pain. I don't understand pain. I didn't go to, you know, medical school like that. I can do stuff that we can work around it, but I'm not going to try to like address somebody's pain other than work around it and build like in, you know, like these like progressions that, but so it's, it's nice to have like people like you that you're not just like, uh, talking to other, uh, 
people that are doing exactly what you do. You're, you're speaking to the personal trainers, you're writing books for them. You're, you're doing that. So that that's a, that's a huge help. And I don't know if it was around when I first started training, I guess you probably were, but I wasn't aware of you, but I wish I would have known now. I wish I would have known then what I, what I know now about like who to study. So that, that uh, I really do appreciate your work. Or do you have like anything uh, new coming down the pipeline? Like how can people like find out about what you're doing? And well, uh, I we, we, it's always been a policy of ours. We, we, we don't uh, go on social media and say, "Oh, here's what we're working on, and here's what we're going to do." Mm-hmm. We only discuss things that we've completed, and we're ready to stand behind a little bit. Um. So uh, a recent project, I wrote a book with Brian Carroll called Gift of Injury. Brian was a uh, world-class power lifter with a very massive back injury. And it was a, a, the story of how he uh, adapted his tissues, filled in the, 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 the fractures and then the, the, the uh, very heavily damaged discs that he had. And uh, he adapted those back to no pain and rebuilt them as we show before and after MRIs, for example. And uh, then he spent uh, a year training and came back and won the Arnolds for the next, uh, I know he won them the next year, but uh, it might have even have been the next two years. So it was a wonderful story of how uh, a strength athlete regained his uh, athletic career, uh, but what was required to do that. Um, we've uh, built several type, types of lumbar supports for people sitting. And uh, that's very specifically to de-stress those who have disc bulges um, for sitting at the office or sitting in an airplane and that kind of thing. Well, we had a little bit of a problem with the people who've already had spine surgery. So they've got a scar down the middle of their back, but they still need the support when they sit to de-stress the disc. And we've, we've, we've developed it. We've done the field trials and we're just working on the final uh, packaging right now for this lumbar, as we call it, uh, support for those who've had surgery. And we've taken out part of the inflation that goes right down the middle. And so it really uh, gives comfort to the people who've, who've been post uh, back surgery and they're, they're back to work, but they need that support to sit. Um, I, I can tell you something that you might find interesting or your listeners might find interesting about my own training. Uh, every time I talk to Pavel, maybe once every three months or so, <clears throat> and he always says, Stu, how is your training? <laughs> That's my best accent. But anyway, <laughs> and, uh, I, I've, I've had, uh, you know, a, a, an interesting life with, uh, tra- training hard when I was younger and whatnot, but I had hip replacement. Uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, I I've had a problem in my right leg, you know, they, they, they cut off your ball and and give you a new socket and they drive a post down your femur. Mm -hmm. Well, that post I've had real tip stresses on. So if I walk upstairs, the metal titanium post is in a different elastic modulus than the bone. So it never quite settled in. And I always had these really bad bone pains down my femur to my knee until about two months ago. About two months ago, I got one of these, I don't know, do you know what a Tesla coil is? So it looks like an MRI machine. It's a round coil. And if you put a DC current around the coil, it makes a, makes a magnetic field a flux field. So they oscillate the uh, current going through the coil back and forth two times a second. So to know if it's working, you put a magnet inside the coil and you'll see the magnet flip poles back and forth twice a second. Well, you put this around your hips and you won't believe this, but after three or four half an hour treatments, my bone pain went away. Wow. Now, my wife, I'm going to brag about my wife for a minute. She, she was on our national team as a heavyweight rower back in the 80s. Well, now she's well over 50 years of age. This past winter, we were getting her ready to have knee replacement. She's also a fairly competitive master's rower now. Well, she didn't train all winter, and uh, we, we thought she was going to have knee replacement. 
And uh, she started back, had a little bit of manual therapy to try and loosen up her knee. She had uh, one surgery to, to clean out the, the, the junk. She had a couple of PRP injections. And then she decided, I'm going to start training on the uh, rowing machine. And uh, the ERG, as it's called, the rowing ERG. And she said, you know, this isn't really hurting my knee. And she trained a little bit more. And the world championship was two weeks ago in Sarasota, Florida. You know, she went down and won the gold medal for singles. Then she wow. won, another, and then she won another. This is in the world, forty-nine awesome. countries. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, she was also using the Tesla coil around her knees, and she says, "You know, my my knee pain is gone, and I can start to train." So she had a crash, uh, taper down, and and peak for for for, for the games, but. Uh, she, she, it was an incredible story. Now she did have PRP. She did have some manual therapy and she did, did have uh, one, one surgery. However, what took the bone pain away almost immediately was that was the Tesla coil treatment. So now I've tried it on spine patients for bone pain in their spine and I haven't had any success. So uh, it may not work on axial spines, I have a sneaky suspicion that it works on some hips and knees and the extremities. Yeah, and, and maybe it's the, the cycles per second. Um, you remind me of, the, I read the book, The Body Electric, a long time ago. Do you know, what the, have you heard of that book? I have not, but you're, you're very perceptive, uh, Ryan. It's at two hertz. Two hertz is the frequency that stimulates stem cell production. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So for some reason, those cells were desensitized. Yeah, the, the body electric, it was probably written maybe in the 90s, or somewhere around in there. I think Robert Becker, Dr. Robert Becker. Exactly. Yep, that's and he, exactly. And he, uh, there was like a cut, like this guy, uh, he would have like maybe like a big wound that won't heal. And so he made a, a wrap with a, uh, I don't know if it was like aluminum or some kind of wire through it, um, put a battery in it and like whatever frequency or uh, hertz he wanted it to be. And he was like figuring it out. So four hertz might not be better than two. Uh, more isn't better and less isn't worse. And um, But it might be just like figuring out Maybe it's 2.2. I, I don't know. I have, I have no idea. I would just be guessing on what it would be. But it, it seemed like his, I mean, I'm reading it at, I don't know how old I was, but, and I'm not a, a scientist, but I'm reading his book. Like, so, and then just what you said, maybe it's just figuring out that the right frequency. So maybe for the spine, maybe it's four, or maybe it's, you know, who knows what. Well, I, I have played a little bit with that. Uh, eight hertz doesn't feel good on my uh, hip prosthesis. Hmm. Two hertz. Start with two. Yeah, um, but but anyway, if if people are interested in that, the system I used it was called the Easy System, and it's built by uh, Centurion Systems. I think their website is centurion-systems.com. If they they want to see what this thing is, yeah. uh, I I I don't have any um, um, business relationship with them, but I I went back and I told my surgeon, and he's trying it now on two other. Uh, patients who have the same tip stress phenomenon. It, it, apparently it happens in one out of uh, 100 hips that are replaced. Well, yeah, my, uh, my mom is looking at um, a knee replacement and I'm trying to get her to look into like stem cell therapies and stuff. It seems like there's a guy, um, he has clinics in America, maybe other places too, but his main one is in Panama. Um, What's his name? Um, he was on Joe Rogan's podcast with Mel Gibson. Yeah, he yeah. did Mel Gibson's dad. Yeah, I'm very. I've had stem cell therapy myself on on one of my hips. Yeah. Okay. How did that work for you? I think quite well. Uh, now that hip wasn't as shot up as the other one, so uh, I think it's helped a little bit. Um, now I only had that at the beginning of August, and we are now in October. So it's been uh, approaching three months and you really don't see the full effects till you hit about the six month mark apparently. But uh, I think it's helping. How about that for a, yeah. a, a soft affirmation of it? 
Yeah, and then on Joe Rogan, he was saying in one of the recent podcasts that it was, I think it's like not stem cells, but it's like what the stem cells cause or miss, miss, like sorts of M or something maybe. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, so my mom, maybe I'll, I'll recommend her checking out that uh, the the Tesla coil like like your wife used for, for her knee. So she was using it at, at two hertz for her knee also. And that yes. was... And she went from, I'm going to go have surgery soon to, I'm actually not going to have surgery. Is that right? So she's, she's no, like, no. She actually went, I'm going to have surgery through to winning uh, a gold medal at the World Championship. That's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. I, I, you know, th th this, is, this, is, this is all about restoring injured athletes to, to world-class levels. Uh, that's, no, I'm not going to take credit for that at all, but it was uh, to just... We, you know, one of the things that we will do and uh, experiment with. Of course, she did some strategic exercise and that kind of thing. But I think the, the, the thing that allowed her to train her core and her full body and whatnot was to get rid of that knee pain. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah I'll tell my mom about it for sure because it's like knee replacement sounds like it doesn't seem like they always go very well. And, yeah, it's it's a tough one. Yeah. So um yeah, I could I could talk to you forever. I'd I'd like to have you on every day if you want, but uh <laughs> um is there uh um uh, a way that you want to wrap this up? Is there something like what do you want to leave us with? I, I know like Backfit Pro is your your website. People can find out get your books and videos and everything on there. Is there yeah, well, uh, no, nothing more than that, really. Uh, Backfitpro.com is where we sell uh, our books, and they've been written for the lay public. Uh, that's Back Mechanic. I wrote Ultimate Back Fitness for trainers and coaches. I wrote Low Back Disorders for docs and, and physios and, and the real clinical crowd. Uh, uh, Gift of Injury was for the uh, strength athlete. And then we have uh, our video series on golf and one for the combative athlete, so the fighters, for example. Um, so, uh, oh, and the courses that we put on that the clinicians will be interested uh, in, uh, in attending is, is uh, on there. And we try and put out a little bit of uh, material. Uh, uh, I hope your podcast will be on there. So we have a section for podcasts. Oh, cool. and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll link uh, this session, I hope. Yeah. Uh, to that so uh, people get to hear um, uh, you know, different positions and thoughts and little mini essays if you will mm -hmm. on uh, topics of interest for performance and health uh, but as you know I'm a, I'm a spine geek so uh, they, they usually have uh, some centricity around the back. Yeah it's fascinating I, I really appreciate you coming on and um, talking with me for, for so long I've uh, I've been reading your stuff for a long time and, and I wasn't expecting, you know, something about the knees to help my mom out. So I was thinking, you know, different ways I can, you know, of course, help myself and my clients and stuff like that. But I wasn't expecting the, um, the thing about the knees. And so it was, it's really cool to have you on. I'd, um, yeah, I'd be glad to have you on again. Any, any time you feel like, uh, <laughs> feel like it. So, um, well, I will uh, stop the recording and I will talk to you for just a second after I hit stop. Okay. Thanks very much, Ryan. All right. Thank you.